15-year-old Annie Katzschak had always dreamed of starting her own family. And when she met her boyfriend, Chris, she fell in love with him. And she believed that this dream could become a possibility. However, when a lie that she was pregnant got out of hand, Annie felt that she had no choice but to run away from home. The very next day, her disfigured, beaten body was found in a river. And the murder investigation was derailed by a description of a suspect who didn't exist, a false witness who accused the wrong men, and a family who lied to provide an alibi for their murderous son. This is the tragic case of Annie Katzschak. Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. Thanks for joining me. Today's case is one that will make you take a sharp intake of breath because it's a case where a young person murders another young person for absolutely no real reason at all. And it will leave you questioning, is this about circumstances that just unraveled, about decisions made in the heat of the moment, or is this about a premeditated, cold-blooded murder? Is this about a desire to kill as opposed to a belief that killing was the only option? I'd love to have your comments at the end of this to clarify what you believe are the reasons behind what happens in today's story. So let's look at Anne Grace Kapschak. She was known as Annie. She was born on the 10th of January 1997. And I guess the way that we describe the home she was born into would be unstable. It was dysfunctional. She faced abuse there and it was one of those chaotic early starts because she had a lot of displacement in her early life. She lived in a lot of foster homes because she was removed from her parents' care because of the problem behaviour. And then when she gets to nine years of age, so that is a hell of a lot of displacement. It's a hell of a lot of lack of consistency in a kid's life. To get to nine years of age and still not to have a really stable foundation, it can be devastating for kids. Attachment issues are huge in children who don't feel that they have foundations to offer them a sense of safety. And so when you deal with children who've been in the foster care system, often if they haven't had somebody early intervene and give them a home and a family, there are gonna be long-term problems. They're going to struggle to trust their environment. They're often going to struggle to form relationships with primary caregivers who step into their world because, understandably, their security has been fractured to such a degree that anybody who walks into their world they imagine is going to exit at some point. Or it makes them form such intense, fused connections that this can be equally problematic because often there is a temporary level to the fostering experience. So by the age of nine, not having anything that's been permanent will have had a huge impact on the way that she views the world around her. But a gorgeous thing happens when she's nine years of age. Dennis and Veronica Kapschak, they step into her world and give her a whole new life. Now, Veronica Kapschak is actually Annie's case manager in child services. And she was actually pregnant at the time that she adopted Annie. But clearly, you're talking about the kind of caseworker that is so vocationally attuned to what she does, so empathically charged, that when she builds a relationship with Annie, she doesn't just build a relationship that's professional and caring and loving towards this particular client. She sees Annie as having potential and she sees that she can bring into that child's world the very secure foundations that she's lacking. You cannot imagine a more caring and compassionate kind of human than Veronica, because she's willing to give Annie the second chance that she absolutely needs and deserves. Veronica said that Annie had had a really hard time trusting other people, which makes perfect sense. Think about her abandonment issues, think about her attachment issues, and also, the abuse that she suffered early on, 
That's going to make her question every single other human person who walks into her life. And for Veronica to know that and to actually take her on into her family, it demonstrates two things. One, the fact that Veronica is the absolutely right kind of person that should be working in the services that she's working. And secondly, that she sees something with Annie that she believes she can bring out. She can foster everything that she's been lacking to help Annie thrive. And for Annie, this is genuinely an opportunity for her to do that. Apparently during their work together, their bond had been developed and this means that when she finally adopts her, her life just transforms. It dramatically changes for the better at this point. She's got a wonderful family life. She's got two younger brothers who absolutely adore her. And even when that archetypal perfect family doesn't last because the couple separate, they still maintain a really good relationship with the children and between one another. So yes, it's not the mother and father scenario that we'd all hope for, but nonetheless, because they get on with one another, the co-parenting takes place. And that means that there isn't necessarily further dysfunction in Annie's life, just a acceptance that things have changed, but that doesn't mean that the world that she has now fostered and forged isn't a stable one. Now, both of those parties end up getting remarried. Veronica gets married to James Bratcher, and the couple actually moved to Utah with Annie and her brothers. And James, Veronica's new husband, said that Annie genuinely had him wrapped around her little finger and that she could genuinely talk him into anything. And that's lovely because I'm in a step-parent family and there are challenges in these families because understandably, the person who walks into your life doesn't necessarily have a blood bond or a familial bond with your kids. And they have to build that on the job, so to speak. And when you see the non-related parent nurturing your kids and caring for your kids and being passionate about your kids and being protective of your kids, it's a beautiful thing to witness because they don't necessarily need to forge those kind of bonds. And James clearly does that with Annie. She's described by people who knew her as being just genuinely caring. She had a great spirit and she was somebody who had the power to love so strongly, is the quote. And again, that's very resonant of a child who's experienced all of these transitions and dysfunction in their life. And finally, they're in a place where they don't have to question that they're loved. It means that they can powerfully connect. And all of that love that didn't have a chance to be placed in safe spaces suddenly has a direct place to go. And for Annie, that must have been how it felt, that finally she's tethered, that finally she has an anchor a strong familial anchor. She attended the Summit Academy and apparently she wanted to be a therapist when she was older like me. So I guess that that comes again from that sense of feeling that she's been let down in lots of different ways as a child and that's caused and provoked a lot of trauma and maybe because of her experience and understanding and personal identification with what it's like to be a child from that kind of dysfunction, she can really help other children who struggle in similar situations. If you understand trauma, often you can help others navigate the dark territory and terrain of moving through that trauma. Now, whilst attending school, Annie, like most kids, wants to date and she meets a guy called Darwin Christopher Bagshaw. Now, he goes by the name Christopher or Chris. She'd met him in maths class and, like so many kids, when you're a teenager, you don't have mortgages to pay. You don't have to worry about whether your car's full of petrol or whether the food shop is going to be delivered or whether you are indeed yet again going to have beans on toast because you've forgotten to do any of those responsible things. When you're an adult, there are so many life admin tasks that even when you're falling in love, you still need to negotiate the amount of time you can attend to such an activity. But when you're a kid and you start a relationship with someone, it is so intense. It's something that makes you feel almost obsessed because they're new feelings, they're new experiences, because you aren't yet a grown up. So you're still dealing with that bridge between being the child and being the young adult. And even fancying somebody is an alluring experience, but when you really connect and you get feelings and sentiments reflected towards you, 
it can just transcend anything you've ever known before emotionally and you have the time to really fixate so when she connects with christopher bagshaw understandably as she starts to spend time with him she genuinely thinks that she's in love with him and she will be she won't have the nuance of what love is like down the line like most adults will but for her in that experience it will feel pure and simply as love does and it's intoxicating she would write things in a diary about how much she loved him and in 2012 they'd actually been together for around a year and a half which is pretty awesome because when you look back at when you were a teenager i'm sure there are a few things that will resonate first of all a week feels like 150 years simple as that time is in a whole different paradigm and therefore, when you're dating somebody for, I don't know, two and a half weeks, you think, probably going to get married. Probably going to get married two and a half weeks. Two and a half, it's a whole two weeks longer than my last relationship. We're definitely going to have kids. That's how you compute the world. To be with somebody for a year and a half of that age, with all the pressures, all the problems, all the changes, all the dynamics, all the educational shifts, that is pretty good going. And it shows a level of commitment and dedication and loyalty and that relationship from an outside looking in is going to be one that is quite unique and unusual at this age group because we don't expect kids to be in long-term relationships at this point and they certainly have been and you would imagine that for Annie she's built up a level of trust with this guy she feels that he's committed to her most importantly she'll feel safe with him ultimately there doesn't seem to be anything in Bagshaw and Annie's life at this point that resonates with anyone around them that there's some kind of malevolence or sinister reality going on within that relationship. Now, around 9 p.m. on March the 10th, everything changes. This is 2012. So James and Veronica, they've been out for a meal. Annie's been watching her brothers, just an absolutely typical kind of evening. When Veronica and James get home, she goes for a shower. Then after the shower, she goes and checks on Annie in her bedroom. But Annie isn't there. Now, they'd last seen her around 7.45 p.m. At this point, obviously, they're concerned and they look around and they find a note on her bed. And it's blindsiding because that note says that she's running away and that she's going to go to California. Now, this apparently is down to the fact that she's like a lot of kids, create a fantasy. I mean, I'm sure that the vast majority of you watching this right now will be able to relate either on a personal level or will have had friends that you've seen do this. You create a fantasy and then that fantasy gets out of hand. And it's a simple lie that unravels. When you're a kid, you say things sometimes because you want it, even when it's not true, or you need attention because you feel that it's lacking in your life or you're dealing with a drama that you create in your head because it gives you something to do, but also psychologically, you can play with that fantasy. Even though it's not true, you can almost believe it because you speak it out loud. And it feels like that's what Annie's done. She's lied to people about the fact that she's pregnant. And the note reads, my only way out is to run away. Please don't try to look for me because I don't want to be found. Often, when you look at notes like that, you think to yourself, well, what was going on at home? Why would she feel that her only option was to run away? Why is she saying, please don't try to find me, I don't want to be found? Because that would suggest that firstly, maybe the relationships at home aren't quite as strong as we'd imagine. Otherwise, she would be saying, please help me and support me, I've made a mistake. But this extreme reaction would suggest that she feels that she could just walk out of her life and no one's going to come for her. But of course, that's not what this note is saying. This note is throwing a bomb and then hoping and praying that the people who adore you, in this case, Veronica and James, are going to literally do everything in their power to bring you back. It's a way of provoking a reaction. It's a way of saying, this is what I've messed up doing. Can you please come and solve it for me? And you do it in such a dramatic fashion that the people that love you will prove that love for you. 
So the likelihood is she won't have any intention of actually disappearing. She's just hoping to God that that explains the problem and they come up with some solutions whilst also proving how much she matters to them. And that's exactly what would have happened. Now, her parents know that recently she'd had sex for the first time, it was a few weeks earlier. And with this fantasy that she created, they had actually assumed that she was pregnant as a result, but she'd taken a pregnancy test and that pregnancy test had been negative. And then she'd actually gone on to birth control so a very responsible parenting method that you know helping her accept if she is pregnant or understand if she isn't pregnant and then think about next steps which they've done but they discover this note and are horrified it's the worst thing in the world for them they love this child they don't think that she's in any kind of distress or pain and even if she is the reality is they can help her work through that so immediately they ring the police, they report that Annie's run away and her mum is then in a situation where she's thinking to herself, I just need to ring around her friends. I need to ask them where they think she might be because anyone who knows her or is close to her may have the jigsaw pieces that will lead her parents to find her. So she rings Annie's boyfriend Bagshaw to see if he's got any information about her location. Now he says, no, I don't know where she is, but he introduces a new character. He says, look, I don't know where she's gone, but I do know that she was planning on running away. And she was planning on running away with a guy called LJ. Now this is gonna be news to her parents and also super terrifying because she said she's gonna to go to California. She said, don't look for me. Initially, they're reading it as a dramatic reaction of a teenager in distress. But now with this additional information, they're likely thinking, my God, what if she really is? intending on leaving? What if she's left the area already? And who the hell is LJ? Sadly, March the 11th, 2012, her parents have much bigger issues to deal with than whether she's run away to California. Police receive a call from a jogger. This jogger had called and described a bloody scene by the Jordan River, which he'd been running past at the time. He said there were pools of blood and splatterings of blood on the rocks. Also, disturbingly, he'd noticed a kid's shoe in the water. Now, the police go out there, they investigate immediately, and it's confirmed to be human blood. So now the police are looking for somebody who's seriously injured, and they start to search the area. It only takes them about an hour, and with the helicopter flying over the river, they find the body of a young girl floating. She's wearing a red shoe and that matches the one that the jogger's already seen near the bloody scene by the water. The autopsy of that body later revealed that the injuries were absolutely catastrophic. So she had multiple fractures to her forehead, very disfigured face, also multiple skull fractures. The cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head and she was absolutely 100% unrecognisable. In fact, the body was so disfigured her body later had to be identified using dental records. The police at this point, they hold a press conference and obviously they're anticipating at this point that by holding this press conference, they're gonna be able to identify the victim if someone at least recognizes the description that they've provided and they know that somebody's gone missing. Now that press conference is seen by Veronica Kapschak and his mum. Can you imagine? what she would feel in that moment, the absolute horror and dread. There in a press conference, in front of her eyes, they're talking about the body of this young person being found, this unidentified individual, and she knows Annie's gone missing. She's instantly horrified that it could be her daughter. She calls the helpline because the helpline's been set up by the police to aid in the investigation and she tells them all the information that she has about Annie, including that she wore braces. To Veronica's dismay, it's at this point they basically confirm that they believe the body is Annie's and that the missing person case therefore at this point becomes a murder investigation. When Annie was identified by her family, they couldn't tell it was her, aside for one thing. She had a little dimple on her chin. It's the only thing that still was reminiscent of the girl that they'd lost. 
Now, obviously, the police and investigators start to gather information and details. So they, first of all, go to look at Annie's room because they want to check whether she's written any information down, whether there's anything that can assist them with the investigation. They take her diary, for example, and her diary reveals the relationship that Annie had with Bagshaw. So they now know that she's in this relationship with him. And after speaking to her friends, it becomes clear that there's this rumour been going around that she's pregnant with Bagshaw's child. She'd actually written in her diary that for her birthday she wanted to be pregnant. She said she wanted to be pregnant with whatever God gives, a healthy girl or boy. Her mum said that it was Annie's dream to have a secure family of her own. She hadn't experienced it herself for the first few years of her life and that was something that she desperately wanted. And that's what makes it so sad because what we're talking about here is a young girl who feels that if she can be the mother to her own child that she was so denied, then maybe she can make up for that trauma. Maybe she can fill in the pieces and create a new tapestry. And when people judge teenage pregnancies, they do it incorrectly because often we see these relationships with trauma. So for Annie, she is filling in the missing gaps of her own life by imagining having a family of her own. And we all know as adults, it's not as simple as that. Anybody who's got a young child or a newborn knows that it can add stress and strain to a relationship, for example, and it can cause you problems financially, but that's not where kids are in their mindset. It's not how they attend that image and vision in their mind. For her, it's very simplistic. I'll have a baby, my boyfriend will love me, and we'll have a family of our own. That's all she's perceiving this will play out like. Annie's day planner actually had an entry for March the 1st, 2012, which read that her boyfriend had found out that she was pregnant. And then there was another entry that said that Annie didn't believe that Bagshaw wanted the baby. Now, what's really sad, of course, is that the autopsy that they do on Annie is that it confirms she wasn't pregnant at all. This really is just a absolute fantasy in her mind. But again, we can just feel empathy and sympathy for this child because it makes sense that she's so desperate to have this connection with a child of her own. She wants to be the mother that she never had the opportunity to have an experience, at least not in early childhood. We get to March the 14th, 2012. At this point, the police obviously speak to Bagshaw because he's a person of interest. They obtain a warrant because they want to search his house. Now, Bagshaw is very much aware that there are rumours that he's got Annie pregnant. But he says, look, I didn't. I didn't get her pregnant at all. In fact, she was telling people that she was pregnant literally a month after she'd slept with this person called LJ. He said that LJ was this 17-year-old and that he'd snuck into Annie's house to have sex with her in November. Also, he said that Annie was going to be really worried that her family would be really angry because LJ was his older boy. So Bagshaw had said, listen, I just went along and said that I got her pregnant to save her. So he's this hero, knight in shining armour. This girlfriend of mine that I've been with for a year and a half, yeah, she betrayed me with some random stranger. I don't know the initials of his name, but at the end of the day, she might have got into trouble. So I thought, I'll just defend her and pretend that it's my baby, thus putting the spotlight on myself, taking it off LJ, the responsible party, and also defending my adulterous girlfriend. I mean, a little bit of a stretch, but he's going for that story. Bagshaw said that he and Annie had only slept together once. It was a week before she actually disappeared and that was when he was at his friend's house, Spencer. They got together in that respect intimately there. And he said that the last time that he'd physically seen Annie was after school one day the week before. But the last time he'd actually spoken to her was over the phone on the Saturday that she disappeared. And it's at this point that she actually had asked him to run away with her. Now, he said, because obviously he's such a sensible little cookie, that he didn't think it was going to be a really good idea, so he persuaded her not to run away. That Saturday that I'm talking about, of course, is March the 10th. March the 10th is the day that Annie was killed. So when the police question Bagshaw about the day of Annie's murder, Bagshaw talks about the fact that his father was going out, he went out for the night to the bar, and he just kind of chilled, played video games. Then he had gone to his grandma's house and that was because Bagshaw's dad had asked him to stay over at his grandma's that night. Clearly he was going out, having a drink and probably wanted to make sure that Bagshaw was safe. 
he said that he dropped his stuff out his grandma's, but then he'd gone to a friend's house, but allegedly the friend hadn't been in, so he went back to his grandma's house. Now, the friend's house is around a 25-minute walk, so that would essentially take Bagshaw 50 minutes as a round trip. Now, his dad did confirm that he had physically seen Bagshaw asleep in the chair at his grandma's house around 11.30 p.m. And Bagshaw had actually come back home around 9 o'clock the next morning. And his grandma, she also confirmed that Bagshaw had been at that location on that night. So he's got an absolute 100% solid watertight alibi. Now, Bagshaw at this point is asked by the police to give him the shoes that he was wearing that day. Now he complies with this, but he's really worried. And he tells the investigators that he's really concerned that they could possibly find Annie's blood on them. And he said, the reason that I'm worried about this is because I know that she had a nosebleed whilst she and I were at Spencer's house together. And I know, or at least I suspect, that some of this blood may have dropped on my shoe. He also said that whilst this nosebleed was happening and blood was going on his shoes, Spencer, his friend, was allegedly dozing off whilst it was occurring. Just going to throw it out there. That's sounding a little bit on the convenience side, isn't it? Yeah, my, uh, my girlfriend, she had a nosebleed. And I think the blood might be on my shoes, conveniently, because those shoes, if they've got her blood on, may connect me to a crime scene. And I don't want you to do that because... It wasn't me at the crime scene creating that blood situation. It was me being a hero, looking after her nosebleed at my friend's house. And he's a witness. Well, not quite a witness because he's dozing. But at the end of the day, in spite of the fact that she's having this major nosebleed to a point where it's dripping all over my shoes, my friend hasn't been disturbed. He's just dozing, dozing, dozing. Honestly... A little bit convenient, throwing it out there. And interestingly, Bagshaw actually texts that friend Spencer and says to him, can you lie for me? He said, I need you to do something really bad. The cops might come to your house and I need you to tell them that Annie got a bloody nose. I need you to tell them so I don't get blamed. Oh, Spencer should be like, no, no, I'm not going to do that. I mean, I don't know about you. I don't know about you, but if a friend of mine, even my husband, somebody who I rely on in lots of different ways, I really could do with not having him removed to prison. But if he was like, Emma, is it possible if you could just lie to detectives when they come round and ask why I have suspicious blood on my shoes related to a murder victim, just tell them that I was with that murder victim when they had a bad cut to the hand and I got an elastoplast for them and that's why I've got their blood on my shoes. I would be like, <laughs> don't come home, I'm calling the police now. That's what an average person should do. But I get it, Spencer's a kid, he believes his mate, he's not thinking, mm, Bagshaw is probably the kind of guy that I'd imagine could have a malevolent spirit and do the worst thing in the world to somebody that I know. He's just gonna believe that his mate needs some help and hey, Sometimes people get blamed for crimes that they haven't committed. So he gets him on side that way. We get to March the 16th, 2012, and the police go and question Spencer. Now, at that point, Spencer initially said that Annie had bled onto Bagshaw's shoe. They also then asked Spencer about LJ. Now, Spencer at this point says, oh, yeah, I don't know who LJ is. I've never spoken to him, but... I did receive a weird email from Annie's account in November and it was supposedly from this person called LJ. He said that LJ may be in a gang and that he'd actually personally warned Annie to stay away from him. So at this point, we've had a few people talking about this mysterious LJ, so he becomes a person of interest in the murder case. But no one's seen LJ in person. No one's spoken to LJ in person. No one's actually physically spoken to him on the phone either. He's kind of like an enigma. And bear in mind, it isn't just Spencer and Bagshaw who haven't had direct contact with LJ. It's any friends of Annie as well. He's just a mysterious being. Now, Spencer ends up admitting that he didn't actually see Annie getting a bloody nose. And the police also tested Spencer's house for blood, but they found nothing. But bear in mind, what we do know is that Bagshaw has a solid alibi. 
his family have admitted that he was absolutely 100% present. So there aren't really any reasons to investigate him much further because he couldn't be in two places at the same time. He couldn't be killing Annie whilst also asleep at his grandma's. Now, around a week after Annie was murdered, a really bizarre set of events unfold. So the police receive a tip from a lady called Joanna Franklin. She says, listen, I'm really happy to provide some information, but if I provide you with information, I have these charges pending against me and I need these charges to actually get dropped. So she'd previously been involved in credit card theft. She was a career criminal to some degree. She had a high level dependency issue with drugs. So understandably there was criminality in her background. And because she had these dependency issues, she was looking at time inside for acting in ways that were criminal. So she wants the police to cut her a deal, simple as that. So Joanna tells them that three men, LJ, Daniel Ferry, and Venia Vekit, were involved in Annie's murder. Apparently there's a house party on, and this is where it occurs. Now, she doesn't refer to Annie by her actual name. She calls her that girl. Joanna says that she did know LJ quite well. She'd been at a house party. She'd heard LJ and that girl having sex. She then said this other guy, Daniel Ferry, he'd made a sexual play towards Annie. And she declined this. But also, she didn't just decline it. She humiliated him to some degree because she laughed at him in front of the group. Now, he felt really upset by this. She had spurned him in front of his peers and he was an individual who wasn't going to take that sitting down and apparently he'd become very violent towards Annie, slammed her head into the wall, kicked her until she was unconscious. And according to Joanna, Daniel, Venya and LJ had actually changed Annie's clothes because she was covered in blood. And they were described as being incredibly similar to the clothes that Annie was found wearing. And then she watches them as they put her in a car and drives this girl away. Now, when the three men return, they've all got blood on the clothing. And Daniel said that Annie had decided to go swimming. Should we say that in inverted commas? And also that she'd put up one hell of a fight. Now, when Joanna describes LJ, she says that he's shorter than she is. He was 19 years of age. He's Hispanic. And the police are just rubbing their hands together because this is crucial information for them. Now, both Danny and Venia were gang members and both of them had a history of crime. So let's be honest, this fits their MO, right? The police are now convinced this could absolutely link LJ and these other guys to Annie's murder. Her story is entirely believable. And she'd also done the most important thing. She provided the first physical description of this elusive LJ. So at this point, a search warrants obtained for Daniel's home, one of the guys who's been identified as being there that night. The police go and there is evidence of a crime scene. So the walls have all been painted, the carpets have been removed and also, very incriminating, there are these red blood stains on the doors. So he's arrested straight away. At this point he's like, I don't get this. I don't know anything about Annie. I've got no relation to her. I've had no involvement with her disappearance and death. None of this is making sense. Now, when they take the blood samples from the doors, it doesn't match Annie's DNA. So they are absolutely convinced that there has been a crime that's taken place at the house, but there is nothing to indicate that Annie had ever been there. There's no connection with her being present in that place. Also, when they look at his phone records, they can tell he wasn't even near the location where Annie was murdered. And it's also found that he has an alibi, which is kind of helpful. So he was actually committing another unrelated crime during the time of Annie's murder. I kid you not. Yeah. Well, my alibi for not carrying out that crime is that I was carrying out another crime. Yeah, I was kidnapping somebody. You cannot write this, can you? I mean, you can. I'm doing it right now by giving you a video on it, but that's literally what happened. His alibi for not being a murderer was that he was just an abductor. 
So yeah, he got done for kidnapping, drug possession and distribution. That was what he accepted a plea for when he came out with this particular alibi because clearly the police are not going to be like, oh, that's fine then, sorry, we're just going to leave you. We're just going to leave you. It, you just, you were just carrying out another violent, high-level crime at the time that this other one was playing out. That's cool, we've got the alibi now. You just go on your way. So he actually gets done for that. So these crimes took place at the time of Annie's murder, so they absolutely can discount this individual from the killing. Now, at this point, they bring Joanna back in because everything that she said really seemed to make sense and add up. But it's during this interview that she decides to tell the truth. She says, yeah, okay, I lied to you. So the police end up dropping the charges as well against Daniel and Vinya because they said there's no longer going to be these individuals considered persons of interest because we now absolutely know that Joanna made false witness claims. Now, this false information was a nightmare. Basically, she set that investigation to find Annie's killer a year, a whole year. And the amount of money that they'd spent, they'd poured resources into this red herring and into these false leads. And that meant the real killer was still out there. And that is pretty devastating for investigators because you're talking about an incredibly high level, violent, predatory murder. And if that killer is still walking the streets, then that killer can strike again at any point. So this isn't just about Joanna lying. This is about Joanna allowing a killer to be walking the streets and to be able to literally strike at any point in time. Now, the reason that she reckons that she actually gave this information to the police, she says she was coming down from drugs. She was addicted to heroin. She was addicted to meth. So she wanted to tell this story where Daniel got into trouble, but also, more importantly for her, gave her immunity from past crimes that she committed. And in another report, it's claimed that in the first instance, she had genuinely confused Annie with another girl. And Joanna said that over time, she kind of tweaked the story to match what she thought the police officer wanted to hear. And that wouldn't be unusual. We know that in interrogations, particular mindsets and characters and personalities will try to impress the interrogators, particularly if they're not implicating themselves. They just want to be a good little witness. They will additionalise and try to gauge what the investigators want and then produce that. And clearly for her, that would have meaning because she's thinking, I'm going to get all of my past crimes written off and this is going to ingratiate me to the police themselves, whilst also meaning that I'm not looking at some hard time potentially. Now, Daniel, from the beginning onwards, always maintained that he was completely innocent in relation to Annie's murder. He said, I'm a lot of things. I'm a gang member. I'm a drug addict. I'm a drug dealer. But one thing I am not, I am not a child killer. And he also went on to say, the cops really dropped the ball on this one. They thought they had an open and shut case with me. And I think that when you think about an individual who's gang affiliated and involved in those kind of areas, you know that the police are going to want to put you away. And if they have an opportunity to pin a crime on you and they think that they have good reason to, you bet your bottom dollar they are going to go out of their way to have that bias to attach it to you because they want you off the streets. But even though Daniel is a criminal, he's also absolutely correct. This man that a cold blooded killer was still walking the streets. And Daniel said the whole reason that he was implicated in this crime was because Joanna, a drug addict, was mad at him. He'd been providing her apparently with heroin, he'd cut her off a few days prior to the murder of Annie, and he said that she was just this really hateful person and that she made the whole thing up because she was angry and upset that he had cut her off regarding her drug supply. So now the police are going back to day one. They have to go through everything again. They have to turn their attention back to all the other potential suspects. And there is one primary suspect, Chris Bagshaw. And there are reasons why it's quite stunning that they didn't go down that route of inquiry further at the very beginning. Because they've obviously traced forensically calls between people and phone records. It's just what you do when you're looking at potential suspects. And it's found that Chris Bagshaw's grandma actually was calling Chris loads of times on the night that Annie was murdered. 
including after midnight, which is really hard because Chris Bagshaw had said he was at his grandma's house at that time. And his dad had verified that Chris was asleep at his grandma's by 11.30 p.m. that night. Now, the police obviously revisit this, ask the questions because it just doesn't make sense. I mean, don't get me wrong. We've all probably done what I've done on occasion, which is called my child, even though they're just upstairs. But that's because I have quite an exhausting life. And the idea of walking up the stairs just doesn't always figure in my world. And sometimes my throat is a little bit sore and doing the classic Northern British thing, which is to just shout very loudly from the kitchen, hoping that the voice will just get up the stairs and into the bedroom so the child will respond. It doesn't always work. It doesn't always compute. It doesn't always have the effectiveness. So sometimes, just sometimes, I do call my kids on the phone. Often, it's deeply disappointing because they have them on silent a great deal. But nonetheless, what I'm saying is, the occasional call, sure, it makes perfect sense. You could call your kid to say, what do you want for your tea? But if you are perpetually ringing, that makes no sense because you would just go knock on the door that they were in the room of, or you know you would resort to, as I just noted, shouting them. So it's clear to the officers that the account of the night just isn't really playing out. It's not making sense when you combine it with the phone records. They also find out that Annie had received a blocked number call that night. So back in the original investigation, they'd made that assumption because they'd been told about LJ that it must be him but actually what they uncover is that it's from Chris. It's Chris Bagshaw calling Annie on a different phone. And automatically that makes the hackles on the back of their neck stand up because they're suddenly realizing there is far more to this story than they imagined. And maybe, just maybe, the true suspect has been on their radar since the moment this investigation began. So now the police are on to Chris Bagshaw. They are convinced that he is not telling them the full story, so they interview him again. And it's at this point he says, OK, game's up. LJ doesn't actually exist. And he said that Annie had made LJ up because she wanted to make him jealous, so he decided to use that name when he was talking to the police because he wanted to try to shift the blame away from himself. They also find out that Bagshaw owned a BMX bike and a witness had earlier told the police that they'd actually seen a teenager on a bike near the river on the day that Annie was murdered. Bagshaw's mobile phone also places him near the murder scene when Annie's mum had called him to ask if she knew where she was. Can you believe that? He denied knowing anything about where Annie could be. He even introduced his character, LJ, to her mother all the while close to where Annie lost her life. We get to October 2014. This is two years after her death. Two years after Annie's family had not been given the answers that they so deserved. At this point, Chris Bagshaw is finally arrested for first degree murder and obstruction of justice. When Bagshaw was arrested, he pled not guilty and his trial was due to begin on March the 7th, 2016, which is harrowing for any family because you know that you're going to have to sit while somebody denies what they did to your loved one. You're going to have to hear in minute detail what played out in that crime. You're going to have to bear witness to things that you should never have to bear witness to. But then in February, he changes his plea. So just a month before, he says, OK, I admit it, I'm guilty. So then we get to the sentencing hearing. This begins April the 25th, 2016. Turns out that Chris Bagshaw had agreed to meet Annie on the night of her death. And this was all entertaining those plans that she had of running away. There she is, imagining the star-crossed lovers, that he's on her side that maybe they really can run away together, start a new life, that maybe she can leave behind the fantasy that she's created and the fear that she have of others viewing her in a judgmental way because she's created this fabrication of a pregnancy, but that he is on her side in spite of this. So he goes and meets her. Now he claims 
that when he went to meet her, he actually believed that she was pregnant, that she was telling the truth. And so when he actually met her that evening, he just brutally attacked her. He took a shovel and repeatedly hit her in her face and head with that shovel. Now just imagine the brutality involved in that. This is somebody that he spent a year and a half dating. This is somebody he's built bonds with. This is somebody who loves him. This is somebody who's made mistakes like we all do, but she's done absolutely nothing wrong. And he had the foresight and premeditation to take a shovel so that he could basically mutilate her body with it, destroy her facial features with it, break the bones in the face that he was meant to love. And after he's done that, he threw her in the river, just discarded her like rubbish. And Chris said, the reason that I did it is because I snapped. I couldn't deal with becoming a father so young. Now, there are so many things wrong with that particular statement. First of all, you don't have to. At the end of the day, there are a lot of deadbeat dads who don't have any involvement with the kids. There are a lot of single mums out there who are taking the burden on themselves because their other half or the partner just disappears. It's as simple as that. You just say, no, I don't want to be a dad. And you haven't got any financial connection because you're not earning any money at that point. And then down the line, you'll figure it out. So there is no reason why you have to worry about being a father so young. That's just an excuse. It's a permission base for the actions that are so malevolent. It's unbelievable. It's hard to describe, in fact, because it is so left field that he chooses to go down this route. And also, the prosecution say, at the end of the day, you meticulously tried to cover up your involvement in the murder. So you weren't just thinking about this moment of snapping. You were thinking about, okay, I need to kill her and get rid of her body, or at least create distance between me and the crime so that I'm not implicated. I need to create a fabric and a story that prevents me from being seen as a potential perpetrator because not only does he not want to be a father, he doesn't want to be considered a murderer. He wants to go on with his life freely. So that's premeditated. He didn't just snap. He planned it. He organized to meet her. He called her from a private number. All of these things indicate that he knew exactly what he was going to do. And also the killing itself, it was deliberate. It was cold blooded. It was utterly brutal. So this isn't somebody who snapped in a moment of a loss of control. And also he then went on to actually have the foresight to call his friend and ask his friend to cover up for him. He made a situation play out where genuinely, aside from having an alibi that his own family gave him, he had a friend who he believed and hoped would cover for him regarding the blood on his shoes. And his mother, Veronica, during the sentencing, she said, look, I want the maximum sentence. She said, he didn't kill on impulse, but instead he was somebody who felt that she was gonna complicate his life and he just felt that she was expendable. He just decided that he wanted to remove this complication. So she wants her daughter's legacy to be this man receiving a sentence that is deserving of this cold, calculated, manipulating, Machiavellian type of crime. Because that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about the most callous type of killing possible. And his father, Dennis, he gave a really emotional testimony. He said it would have taken repeated hits with a shovel to make his daughter that unrecognisable. He said, when I saw her there, it wasn't my daughter. It was something you would see being hit by a train. The only identifiable feature of my young daughter, my baby girl, was a little dimple on her chin. What a horrific image for her loving father to have to carry for the rest of his days. The final exchange, the final moment those precious seconds left with his baby girl, the stain on his conscience being that he couldn't even see her face, just the dimple on her chin. The dimple on her chin. It's so profound, isn't it? Because to other people, it's one of those things that you don't really pay that much attention to, but a loving dad, they're the features that he'll be able to link with indelibly because of the fact that every tiny bit of her face will have focused and meaning to him and that little dimple on her chin, it stood out.
because he knew every part of who that child was. So and his family, understandably, want Bagshaw to be sentenced for as long as possible. Now, Bagshaw's defence team, they, of course, want him to be sentenced as a juvenile because he's 14 years of age when he brutally murdered Annie. But they feel that as a young person, you shouldn't be considered in the same way as an adult. And in lots of cases, I think we can all agree that you do change a lot. What you do at 14 is not what you do at 24. Just look at your hairstyles at 14. Look at your fashion when you were 14. Often, you're kind of glad that you no longer have that mindset when you get to 24 because we make some pretty big errors when we're kids. But we're talking about something that was cold calculating, manipulative and well-planned. So that doesn't sound like a 14 year old, does it? When he's carrying out the brutal murder of this innocent girl. This doesn't sound like the inner workings of a chaotic teen who really doesn't know what they're doing. There's something deeply and darkly malevolent about these actions. He takes a shovel and destroys Annie's face and discards her in the river. Do we really want to be giving short sentences to individuals like that? And bear in mind, if he was treated as a juvenile, it would mean that it was possible to give him three years in prison. So that would mean he'd get released potentially at the age of 21. And I don't know about you, but the idea of somebody with such a capacity for harm to think that they'd get three years and end up back on the streets, that's very disconcerting for me. Now, Judge James Blanche, he does the sentencing and he decides to sentence him as an adult and he says this, a terrible crime deserves a terrible sentence and here we have about the worst crime that one can possibly imagine. He ends up getting sentenced to 15 years to life in prison. Now that means that he will actually be able to apply for parole in 2034, but it doesn't mean he'll get it. I mean, you genuinely can spend the rest of your life in prison if they don't feel that you're going to be safe to be on the streets again. Now Bagshaw did actually apologise in court. He said, I'm very sorry for everything that's happened and I want to apologise to Annie's family and to my family and to everybody in court today for putting everybody through this. Veronica and his mum said this, may you feel sadness, may you feel loss, may your tears heal your soul. And I guess that that demonstrates and encapsulates what you hope a perpetrator will feel which is what you've done to me and my family is so treacherous, has created such a void, such a chasm of grief, that I hope you feel this too. I hope that your punishment is to know this pain. I hope that through feeling that, through empathising with that, through feeling lost in your own life, whether that's the loss of freedom that he experiences, whatever loss it may be, she's saying that by experiencing that sadness, maybe, just maybe, he'll become a better human being. And in the end, that compassion, that empathy that he grows and develops will heal the darkness that resides within him. And let's be honest, if you had a child and their life was stolen in such an incalculably cruel way, it would be very difficult for you to have anything but fear about that person who took the life of that loved one ever having the chance to walk the streets again. You'd be terrified about it. You'd want to believe that some transition would occur so that they could finally know what it was and how it is to be a good person. So that one day if you ever are freed, we don't need to fear you. And also it always provokes a feeling in me, which is there's no consolation when somebody apologises in court, is there? It doesn't make up for the senselessness of this beautiful girl losing her life. The fact that he was free for two years gets me. I mean, the fact the family know that he had two more years of his adolescence just walking the streets, that just rubs salt into the wounds of the family. And yeah, the family finally received justice for Annie. But it doesn't numb the pain in any way of losing her. And can we all be honest about this? He had those years free. 
And if he was capable of murdering Annie over a fantasy that she had about having a baby, or even if she had been pregnant as a reason to kill her because of that pregnancy, it means that he absolutely had the potential to harm others. And he had two whole years where he could have done that because of the investigation going off kilter because of the false information that was provided by a witness and also because of the police bias, which is, well, it makes sense that a gangbanger is more likely to have murdered this girl than her boyfriend who actually had motive and also whose records phone wise and alibi wise clearly demonstrate that he could have killed her. And we also have to bring in the fact that his family lied. What the hell were they doing? They knew he wasn't there, clearly. His grandma was ringing him. His father said he physically saw him. And no matter how much you love your kid and how much you want to protect them, you don't need to protect them as long as they're telling the truth. But they were willing to distort that truth to keep him out of trouble. And yeah, they may well have believed that he was innocent and they just wanted to give him an alibi because they wanted to bolster that innocence. They wanted to not have the waters muddied by the potential of him being implicated when really they believed he was completely innocent. But look at what that did. It caused others to be implicated and it distorted an investigation, cost a lot of money and meant that Annie's family for two years had absolutely no peace regarding how this played out. They couldn't begin the journey of healing because the wound was still open. And I know the wound remains open today, but at least there are closure levels in certain areas, such as knowing what happened and knowing who was responsible. And as I was researching this case, I did find another pretty tragic fact actually. And that is that the lead detective who was initially investigating Annie's murder, Sergeant Johnson, he actually got murdered in 2013. And his wife said that he was one of those officers who genuinely got really affected by Annie's case and he wanted justice for her. And sadly, he never saw that justice delivered for Annie because of those delays. And it's a tragedy that he lost his life, but it feels really unfair that someone so invested in the case didn't get the answers for the family that he so wanted to get. Like I said at the very beginning, what are your thoughts on this case? Do you think that this is about a cold, calculating killer, a predator who's always going to be a danger to our society? Or do you think this is a kid who acted out in impulse and now regrets it and maybe really can change? For me, kids killing kids is always the thing that provokes that reaction within me where I feel conflict because I know that kids change, I really do. It is possible to be someone pretty heinous at 14 and be very good at 40. But when I think about the kind of premeditation, when I think about the brutality involved in this murder, when I think about how Annie lost her life at the hands of a boy that she genuinely loved and wanted a future with, I think, is it really possible that this is about a teenager just going wrong? Or is this simply about a predator evolving in our society. One who, irrespective of his sentence, will always pose a threat to the rest of us. Let me know your thoughts. I'll see you again next time. Take care, guys. Be safe.